Um, our next speaker is Michelle Frechette from Rochester, New York, USA. She's a director of community engagement at Stellar WP and the executive director at Post Status. In her talk, she will emphasize how the diversity within the WordPress community enriches us all. She will highlight the importance of ensuring inclusivity and welcoming everyone to participate fully. Let's welcome Michelle Frischit. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> Zhao En, good morning. It's so good to be here, and thank you for joining me today. As Amy said, I'm going to be speaking to you about underrepresentation and allyship today. And I want to give you first an opportunity to participate in allyship. Many of you may have seen I do a selfie challenge at WordCamps where I ask you to take a picture with me and tweet it or post it on social media with the hashtag Michelle and me. And what I do is I donate money and other people donate money and other businesses donate money and I use that money to help underrepresented speakers and organizers attend WordCamps. So here's how you can participate. Take out your phone. Take out your phone, <laughs> turn around and take a selfie with me in the background, and then tweet it or post it on LinkedIn or any place with hashtag Michelle and me, and you will be helping. Thank you. See, we start today, and you already have an opportunity to help, which I think is wonderful. So thank you for, thank you for participating. So what is underrepresentation? We are all part of the human race, and we are all very individual. So somewhere between everybody is a human and I am just me lies under representation. So here I am on your stage today as an older, disabled, purple-haired woman. Now, not all of those qualify me as underrepresented, perhaps I am underrepresented that I have purple hair, but that doesn't hold me back from doing the things that I want to do. And society, although they may think it looks strange, doesn't say she cannot participate because she has purple hair. But there are other parts about who I am and who each one of us may be that causes people to say she doesn't belong here. First, she. Right there still is, yesterday was International Women's Day. And there's still so much we need to do to help women progress in technology and in other uh, fields that they may choose to participate in. I am a disabled woman. There are so many places that I cannot physically access. This WordCamp has been wonderful. There's ramps for people like me, there, and the hotel is perfect, and everything, I have not encountered any issues. But there are other places in this world where I have a lot of difficulties. WordCamp US, two years ago was an, an incredibly difficult uh, time in my life. The doors to the hotel did not open by themselves. The, the door to my bedroom at the hotel, I could not get in and out by myself. There wasn't a handicapped shower. I didn't have a way to get in and out of the bathtub. I encountered so, I got locked in the, stuck in the bathroom of the hotel lobby because I couldn't reach the door to open it to go out, and I had to ask, I had to call somebody on my phone to say, can you let me out of the bathroom, please, right? So there's lots of things that people like me using mobility devices have difficulty with. That is one way that you can say that I am an underrepresented person. I am older than most people in technology. This is where you all say, you don't look old, Michelle. You don't look old, Michelle. Thank you, thank you. I, I just love you all. But, but I am 55 years old and working in technology, which is fairly old for a woman in technology. And so that sets me apart as an underrepresented class. So I'm a woman, I'm disabled, and I'm older. So all three of those things apply to me. I'm part of the human race. I am sitting on this stage with Crocs on, and I am the only person in this room for whom that is true, but that doesn't make me underrepresented. It just makes me unique today. So you have to look at all of what, what makes a person and what that person is all about them to determine if it's underrepresented. So that's what underrepresentation means. 
what is allyship? So my computer doesn't even recognize allyship as a real word, but I promise you that it is. Allyship can also be called advocacy. There are things that we can do within the, our sphere of influence to help affect change and acceptance for people who have underrepresented classes. And that's what I want to talk about today, is how we can do that and do that better to help others be able to fully participate in WordPress specifically, in technology for sure, but also in life in general. And every single one of us, regardless of our own underrepresented status, can help other people with their underrepresented status as well. So the first thing we talk about is inclusion for underrepresented groups. I want to talk a little bit about underrepresented in tech. Have, has anybody here heard of underrepresented in tech already? So underrepresented in tech is a website that Ali Nimmons and I started uh, three and a half years ago. She and I, she's a, a young, black, queer woman, so she has underrepresented statuses as well, especially in the United States. And I, as I already said who I am, decided that she is in her 20s, I was in my 50s, we had all of these little boxes that we could check off that were underrepresented. And people would come to us as people in the community who have loud voices <laughs> and say, do you know somebody who's black that could speak at my conference? Do you know a woman who I could ask to speak at my, um, my meetup? Or do you know somebody who's disabled or blind or fill in the blank that could maybe, maybe be part of my podcast? So that things weren't always looking like it's just white men in technology. And so we started to talk about, gosh, how can we help fill this gap where people are looking for people, they're trying to be more diverse and inclusive, but they don't know how to do that. And so we started a spreadsheet. And we started a spreadsheet of all the people we knew that had some sort of underrepresented status that we thought, well, I've heard that person speak before. They would probably be okay if I gave their name. And after about a week of populating the spreadsheet with people that we knew, we realized that the people that we knew weren't a big enough pool of people and also may not want to be included. And that's where underrepresented in tech.com became something that all of you could access. So anyone who is an underrepresented person can opt into that database, and then anybody who's looking to be more diverse and inclusive can search the database and invite you to work for them, to speak for them, to be on a podcast, to whatever it is that you need. And so we now have a database of, I think, about 200 people who have opted into that, who have got jobs, who have been asked on podcasts, who have blogged for people, who have done short-term jobs and all of those things because they were in the database and somebody else could find them. We don't charge anything for that. Anybody can be in the database, anybody can search the database, and now we have so many more people than we ever could have known personally who could help fill those spaces and take advantage of opportunities that are afforded to them. So that's how it started with us just saying, why don't we build a spreadsheet to building this whole big project that now also includes a podcast where we talk about what it means to be underrepresented, where we talk about struggles that people in different uh, minority groups within certain parts of the world struggle with, where um, what it means to be fat shamed or ageism or any of the different things that people might encounter as a difficulty or honestly sometimes just hatred and you can feel that to be able to be included in the things that they want to be included in. So we talk about that on a regular basis had a little bit of a hiatus. Ali stepped away from the project at the end of last year. I have a brand new co-host that I'm not going to tell you who it is yet because it's a big secret coming out at the end of the month. But we're picking up the podcast again and we're going to be reinvigorating the project with my new partner. Um, I think you will like her and she's not from the US so we'll have more of an international flair and be able to talk about underrepresentation more than in just the United States. So I'm very excited about that. We are not charging anybody for anything. We, sometimes people want to donate to us so that we can pay our servers and those kinds of things, but we don't even ask for donations. It simply is, it exists 
It's not a 501c3, we're not asking for donations, but we want it to be available to people. At some day, when I retire from being who I am and just decide to watch birds and cats all day long, uh, I hope that somebody else will pick this project up. I will gladly hand it to them so that it can continue. That is one way to practice allyship. Do I think every single person in this room should start a podcast about it? No, that's not, that doesn't make sense, right? That's one way that I practice allyship, is to learn about people and share those opportunities. But every single one of us has an opportunity within events, products that we create, whether that's a digital product or not, projects that we run, the teams that we have, and creating inclusive and dedicated spaces. So let's talk about that a little bit. Events is one of the first places that we have noticed over the years, even before we started Underrepresented in Tech, that there was exclusion for people. I am going to be honest and tell you, I don't even remember what, what, um, what event it was, but there was an event about five years ago, maybe six years ago, where they had 10 speakers, and they were all men. And enough women said, this is ridiculous. And they started to talk about what was happening there. And they, then the, the organizer said, oh my gosh, we didn't even realize. Because it it's, is possible to be exclusionary and not even realize you're doing it because you are so used to working within the groups that you work in. And enough people started talking about it that some of the men dropped off the team, the, the speaker's team, and they started inviting women, and none of the women were like, nuh -uh, I'm not going to be your token woman now that you've had all of this problem go on. So we have to look at how we can create opportunities for people to be on stages, to be on organizing teams, to be on podcasts, and all of those things. So, but you have to do your research to find out who can we reach out to, how can we do those things. We talk about the fact that when you have an event like a WordCamp, we simply put out a call for speakers and cross our fingers and hope that the right people will apply and that we get some nice gender diversity and ethnic diversity and ableism diversity and all of those things. But is that enough? And so one of the things we talk about is you can build something like a WordCamp or any other event and put out a call to speakers and have as many people apply as possible, but you can always also ask people to apply. Now, when you ask somebody to apply, are you guaranteeing them a spot on the stage? Not necessarily, but you're saying to them, we want to hear your voice, and we really hope you'll present a topic that will fit with what we are presenting, what our overall theme is, and we would love to have you if that all works out. So now you have the opportunity for more people to apply to speak, and that's where you start to build that, um, that inclusion and see more uh, diversity on stages, like WordCamps. And I think we've done a really good job, especially here, this WordCamp has always been so diverse, so many women, so many opportunities, and it's been very exciting last year and this year to see that happen. But what does your call for speakers look like? If you have, let's say you're putting, let's say, put WordCamp to the side for a moment. If you're just building an event for yourself and you're using, um, I'm not going to say AI generated images, um, that's Robert's department if you were here for the talk before, but if you're using uh, images like from stock photos, what am I seeing in that stock photo? Am I seeing myself? And it's important that in the imagery and the language that you use on your call for speakers, that anybody who's thinking about speaking sees themselves and sees the possibility of themselves in that space. Uh, I once was asked uh, what some of the work we've done over the years is look at other companies who hire us to say, is my application process to work at my company diverse? Why are we not seeing more women apply? And so we've been able to look at that. And one of the things I've talked about is there, is, there was one application that I saw where as you looked down along the application, it said things like, it gave the job description, and then it said, if you think you might be a good fit, please apply below. Well, to somebody who is not totally confident in the space, and for many underrepresented folks, that may be true, if, think, might, stop them from applying right there. So the language that we use matters. Products. I love to talk about products. So. 
Products should be available for all user groups, not just the people who are creating them. Back in the 50s and 60s, in the United States especially, this is where I'm from, so please bear with me if that's my experience, but in the 50s and 60s, they sold vacuum cleaners with advertising of women in high heels and pearls smiling while they clean their house, and men bought those vacuum cleaners to make their wives happy. Now, of the women in this room, is a vacuum cleaner what you want for a gift at Christmas or your birthday or Valentine's Day? Not usually. Maybe a Roomba so I don't have to actually vacuum, <laughs> but uh, other than that, no, right? So in the 70s, when more women were joining the workforce and going, and going to school for marketing and joining marketing and advertising teams, they said, this is not why we buy a vacuum cleaner, because we can wear pearls and high heels and a pretty little dress to vacuum our house. I want a vacuum cleaner that'll clean up after my children and pick up the dirt that my dog drags in. And so the advertising around vacuum cleaners changed so that it was dress addressing the pain point that we're solving, cleaning your floor, as opposed to how happy and pretty you look when you're using a household, doing a household chore. So when we think about including people who will use our product in the design of our product, we have better opportunity to sell that product too. So if you are designing and you're including people in the decision-making process, in the design process, in the advertising process, who don't just look like you, you have a much better opportunity for success. As I say online, can everybody look at themselves and see themselves using your product? But if they look at there and they see mm, not so much. Also, how many men do you think did the vacuum cleaning when they saw that it, you should be a pretty woman who is doing the vacuum cleaning, right? So the whole idea is that everybody should be included. But we also have better projects. So I have a couple of podcasts. You may have heard of some of them. And I am very careful um, and not even on purpose, but I have always been inclusive in the podcast. So I have WP Coffee Talk is something that I've done for several years now. And I have spoken to people all over the world on uh, six continents. So if you know anybody in Antarctica, please send them my way. <laughs> but six continents in over 27 countries have been on my podcast. And so people who want to speak on my podcast have seen other people that look and sound like them. And that's it has to be in English, because that's all I speak, I'm sorry. But if you speak English, you can be on my podcast. But blogs, podcasts, workshops, webinars, all of those things are being more inclusive means that you are appealing to a wider audience as well. And you are talking to people who bring diverse and wonderful experiences to those conversations. We also develop better teams. How are you recruiting your teams? I talked about that application process. What does it look like? What language are you using? Are you encouraging people to scroll down and fill out that form? Or are you, are you discouraging people from doing that? You would always, I would rather have 500 applicants for a job than five applicants for a job. Because I can choose from a more diverse pool. I can look at more people for their qualifications when I'm looking that way. It should be easy for people to find your application. It should be easy for them to fill it out. You can always ask for more information. But looking at those kinds of things, what time of, inter what time of day are you doing interviews? Um, how are they accessing emails? How are you doing all of that process makes a difference to, for inclusion. And then we should and can develop inclusive and dedicated spaces, safe spaces for underrepresented folks. And this is something that I think WordPress has done well and continues to do well, but can continue further to do well. So for example, for several years now, black press has has existed. There's a Slack channel that they, a Slack community that they have. Blackpresswp.com is their website. There's a wonderful, inclusive, robust conversations happening all of the time. And it's also open to allies. So I am privileged to be part of the Slack community for Black Press. But as a white person, I also just provide resources and not opinion, because it is not my job in that group to try to control anything or to have opinions about things because it's not my underrepresented group. I don't fit there that way, 
but I bring to that group resources. I post job opportunities, I post calls for speakers and things like that that I'm aware of so that other people in that group I'm showing my true allyship for. Last year, at WordCamp Phoenix, I gave a similar talk to this, and I talked about black press. And as a result of that, three different people at three different times approached me in the afternoon and said, is there a space like black press for the LGBTQ plus community? I spent a few hours that afternoon doing some research and discovered there wasn't. There wasn't a safe space like that. So at the after party, sitting at a table with people from the community, and uh, some people from a hosting company, I said, let's, let's do it, let's make it. I will be a resource, I will help you get it started, and then I will back up and let the community run itself. So we created lgbtqpress.com. And there's a Slack community for the, the rainbow community, as I've heard it sometimes called, the LGBTQ plus community. All of, all of the people who fit in that demographic and want to be included have a safe space that they can work with one another to promote each other and have, share similar experiences and ask how you would handle something and all of those things, but have a resource group for one another as a safe space. There's a ladies of WordPress Slack community that you can be part of if you're a woman. Um, there are underrepresented gender release teams that we've had at WordPress. So we've had two of those, uh, and those have been wonderful to participate in. So anybody can participate in those as well. The important thing is to ask yourself, do we have safe spaces for the different communities that might need those, might want those to be a resource for one another, and to find that support that only somebody in that community would understand the need for, and how can we create those safe spaces? If you see a need and you don't see a solution, you can be part of the solution in helping create that as an ally, and that's what allyship is about. How can we do that in tech? It's interesting, right? So like my college, when I went to college back in the 80s, um, we had, uh, it was called, what was it called then? It was the I can't remember, it was like an African-American resource group for the college students. And I remember thinking, well, we don't have white groups for people. And then I was like, oh, right, that was something they did in World War II. We shouldn't do that again. So you have to be careful about what kinds of groups you do create, too, because it should always be to help and uplift people who might not already have access to those things within themselves. And we can do that in tech because we do work remotely. We can create safe spaces like Slack. We can create websites and have these wonderful things. We can have Zoom calls. I've been privileged to sit in on some of the Zoom meetups for the black press community and just be a resource. And when they say, we don't know how to do this, or we don't have access to this, I say, well, in my role here, I can give you access to that. I can provide hosting. I can do other things um, and be able to be a resource to that group. And it's a privilege for me to be able to do that. But we can do that also within campuses and, cor and uh, corporations. My daughter is a black woman. She is a 32-year-old woman who is in banking, and on the weekends, she's a really awesome DJ. And she is the president of the North American African American Resource Group for her bank. And I watch her, and I think, I want to be like her. I want to be like my daughter. I want to do the things that she does to make the world a better place. So if you can find somebody who's doing those things, if you don't know how to start and you don't know how to do it, find somebody who's doing it already and watch what they do and ask questions and emulate and be a safe space for others too. Not all things are equal. This is very specifically US-based because that's the information I have, but it gives you an idea. Equal pay day is the point in the year in which a woman makes as much as a man did the previous year. So all women will make approximately the same amount of money for the same job as a man did in one year, in a year plus March 31st. For Asian women and Pacific Islander women, it's February 11th. I don't know why y'all get it better than us, but it's okay, it's okay. Uh, for black women, it's not until August 13th, Native American women in the US, October 1st, and Latina women, it takes almost two full years for a Latina woman in the United States to earn the same amount of money for the same job as a man did in the prior year. And that's not fair. We need to do more to even that playing field. We talk about the proverbial table. People say, make more room at the table. Guess what? The table's not real. 
The table can be as big as we need to. Nobody has to leave the table for other people to be able to join the table. Nobody's kicking you out because we want more, un more representation at the table. We just want to be there with you. And so everybody can make that table a little bit bigger. You can always make more room. No such thing as crowding. When I was a kid, we have Thanksgiving in the United States. You've probably seen pictures of it. And Thanksgiving was when all the family would come together and make a big turkey. And there was never enough room at the, at the big table. And the kids had to sit in the kitchen or at the coffee table and all these other places and get relegated to other places in the house. But this table is big enough to include everybody because you can make the table as big as you need to. And we can have more than one table. There's plenty of space. We don't have to feel threatened ever because we're making room for underrepresented folks to join us. But allyship requires intention. Is your intention performative or tokenizing, or do you really have a heart to help people? If it's performative and tokenizing, look inside yourself and do some work so that it's no longer performative and tokenizing, but truly intentional to help other people. Understanding your privilege is so important. I'm a white woman in the United States. I have more privilege than my daughter, who is a black woman. And I recognize that, and I do what I can for people like her to be able to have the same privilege that I do. Do the work to create those supportive and open and inclusive environments. Understand what the barriers for participation for others are so we can lower them. And then ask yourself, how can I create opportunities for other people? Because those of us with more privilege really do bear the responsibility to share that privilege with people who don't have as much as we do. And I have some resources for you. And I'm on time, which is amazing, right? Okay. <laughs> Underrepresented in tech.com. There is nothing that you need to do other than use it, join it. We are not asking for anything. It's just a resource to serve for you. WP Career Pages is a place where you can go look for jobs. I created that as a resource for people to help. WPSpeakers.com. If you want to be a speaker in WordPress, you can join that database for free as well. And when people are looking for resources for WordCamps and meetups, I, I'll tell you a secret. I created WPSpeakers.com because I was looking for people to speak at my meetup and at WordCamps that I was part of. And I thought, if I'm having the difficulty of, of sourcing people, Others are too. Let's create a resource for that. So use it. Um, become a member of it if you want to be a speaker. And if you are somebody who's finding speakers for your event, that's a great resource as well. Blackpresswp.com is a wonderful resource, and the LGBTQpress.com. I am available on Twitter slash X at Michelle Ames, and my email address is Michelle at StellarWP.com. I welcome any questions you have. If I can help you be a better ally, I would love to do that. And that's what I have. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Michelle, Thank for you. taking your time to share this important topic with us. Now we are open for Q&A. I always say if there's no questions, I did a really good job explaining it to you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, I just had one question about um, considering uh, recent events in the US, uh, in, with many uh, companies wanting to be inclusive, especially in advertise, adver advertising, um, what's your opinion on, on, on that? And how could company, what could companies do to sort of mm -hmm. mitigate the, uh, the backlash, that, mm -hmm. have, especially with like the recent Bud Light controversy? Yeah. Um, or do you think uh, corporations should not even be involved in trying to be inclusive in, in, in that way, trying to yeah. uh, actually actively be inclusive. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to advocate for inclusivity. Um, and I think that every company should try to be more inclusive, of course. I think that when a company gets backlash, they have to do some internal, um, uh, they have to really think about where they want to go and what they want to say publicly. So with the Bud Light backlash, if you're not familiar with it, um, last year Bud Light put a trans woman on the can for, for a Bud Light beer. And there were people who were buying their beer just to run it over with their trucks to make a statement about the fact that a trans woman shouldn't be on my beer can, right? 
that's just dumb, right? But it did affect their bottom line because even though those people were buying beer to destroy it, other people were influenced by that good old boy, southern, racist, transphobic um, community, and it did affect their bottom line for a while. I haven't checked yet to see if it's come back up. I, I, I probably think it has because people are really... Um, loyal to their brands at some point in time. And so when, when that image was no, when, when uh, Dylan's image was no longer on the can, I'm guessing that those made their way back into their refrigerators. Uh, but, that, but Bud Light didn't come out and say we made a mistake. And I think that's what was most important, is to stand by what you do and pivot so that you say, well, those are not the people we should be selling beer to. Maybe these are the people we should be selling our product to. And see what ways they can do that. And trust that, I mean, they weren't going to go bankrupt <laughs> because of one campaign, right? So it was one of those things where they just had to evaluate and move forward. Um, and I think it's going to look different for every company, exactly how they do that. But I would hate to see companies back down on making important statements in our world because of the, f the force of negativity that would come as a, as a result of that. One of the companies I've talked about on the podcast with Allie, that I'm a crier, so just so y'all know, but Etsy has done an amazing job over the last few years of inclusive advertising around the holidays. Um, so much so that I see, the, like, uh, one of them is a little girl who is an Asian girl whose name is unpronounceable by her teacher, right? Her teacher doesn't even make the um, effort to pronounce her name but her mother gives her a necklace with her name on it. And like, I get goosebumps. Like, I see that and I get goosebumps. There's a, a, another with a couple who are um, a gay couple, and, he, and they're going to the one person's parents' house for Christmas, and he's so nervous about meeting his, his uh, partner's parents for the first time, and how will they accept him? Ah, oh, I'm going to cry. But they, he, they give him a gift, he opens it up, and it's a hand... Um, created image of the two of them to hang on their Christmas tree. And I just blabber like an idiot when I see that because I love the inclusion. Are people not buying from Etsy because of those commercials? Maybe, but Etsy doesn't care because enough people are seeing their intent in their heart to be able to do that. And so if your brand takes a hit for a little while, uh, Cheerios had the same thing. There was an interracial couple, and so many people decided they were going to uh, boycott Cheerios because a white man shouldn't be married to a black woman. Oh, for crying out loud, that's not true, right? And so they took a little bit of a hit in a certain socioeconomic group cl classes, and then they continued what they're doing, and they're just as good as they ever were. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think it's really something that is a case-by-case -case situation. Yeah. I wanted to return back to um, an experience you shared about joining the African American group and you were like providing resources. Yes. So I was curious about as an, a potential ally who is, doesn't feel like you are a part of a group, where do you draw the line between kind of standing back and then like providing resources objectively but not providing opinion mm -hmm. versus actively trying to create spaces to discuss these sensitive issues? Like where do yeah. you draw the line? You make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I've overstepped my bounds before, and that's when I learn. And when I, when I approach with the right heart, I'm usually forgiven and corrected. And as long as I have a big enough, uh, small enough ego to be able to accept correction, then I learn and I move on in a much better way. Um, and then also look and see how other people are being allies and emulate what they're doing. Um, but you will make mistakes, right? We make mistakes in, in our lives, we do. Most of what we do doesn't affect other people, and it's usually more embarrassing for us than them. So if I overstep and I was like, oh, you should do this, and they're like, thanks, Michelle, that was a nice idea, go back to your corner, and you know, kind of, nobody says it that way. But that's how I feel, right, when somebody says that. And it can be very embarrassing, and it can make you want to just withdraw from the group. But most people see, if you're approaching with a good heart, and you're learning how to be an ally, you should never stop learning how to be an ally. Every day I get better at it. Every day I still make mistakes, if it's just in my own mind, and I correct myself sometimes. But as you work on allyship, you get better and better at understanding where those invisible boundaries are. And I have really trusted friends in groups that I say, would this be helpful if I suggested this to the group? Now, I never ever rely on a black community to educate me about blackness. That is not their responsibility. But I can ask a trusted person, 
should I offer this or is this overstepping? And that trusted person will give me advice because they know that I'm trying to help. So it's really just trial and error and being okay with being embarrassed and making mistakes. Thank you, that's a great question. Yes. Hi, Michelle, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you know if there's something like black press or LGBTQ press for autistic people or, ND, or maybe even di uh, disability in general? I'm not aware of one, but just like last year at Work Camp Phoenix, come see me at the after party mm. and maybe we'll get one started because that is a great opportunity. Now, I'm not gonna run this one. I'm not, I'm not running any of them, first of all, but I'm, I, I can't be the resource creator for everybody, but I can certainly give you some tools to get started. And I can find you hosting too, so talk to me later. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much for being here with me today and for listening and for trying to do better and be better as you go forward from today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. So if anyone have any more questions or um, anything you want to discuss with Michelle, I'm sure she will be happy to talk to you. Yep. And you can always catch me at any of those places as well. Take pictures now. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you, Michelle. On behalf of WorkCamp, we would like to give you this gift back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Anybody want a picture? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>